Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go through pretty quickly because I have seven questions and I'm determined to get through all of them. So the first one is for you, Mr. Lumpkin. Is the State Department the correct place to have this conductor? Setting aside some of the issues with the Global Engagement Center, do you believe that state is the best place for this point person to be? I think it needs to be outside of all the departments. Outside of all the departments. Okay. Um, so what uh, functionally, how would that work? Would it be similar to the DNI in terms of having all the, you know, setting aside intel, having the appropriate agencies be a part of that process? I think so. It's the only construct that I know that's cross-cutting across all departments. Okay. Within DOD, who is the conductor? For, I mean, that's, it's a great question because public affairs has a conductor at, at DOD that's in the information space, and you have military information operations that resides uh, oversight at ASD SOLIC. Right. So I asked that question to highlight uh, something that I think we need to focus on. On the Subcommittee for Emerging Threats and Capabilities, we have quarterly briefings when it comes to CT and when it comes to cyber operations. And the briefer is able to go around the world and say globally what the threats are and what our operations are. I fear that if we had quarterly briefings, we would not have uh, one point person who is able to answer our questions region by region by region. So are those models that we should use as we seek to tackle I.O., so what we've worked through over the past 14 years on CT, what we're currently doing in terms of elevating cyber command? Yeah, I think that the Joint Staff J39, which, oh, which is their operation shop that's an information operation, should be able to give you and represent what each of the combatant commands is doing with regard to information operations, keeping in mind that the information operations piece supports military objectives. So do you think that's a, an important kind of forcing mechanism in terms of congressional oversight, uh, thinking about having quarterly briefings on I.O.? I do, and I would recommend it. Okay. What role does Cyber Command have uh, in terms of I.O.? I mean, they're, they're in, because... What, should they, what role should they have? I mean, because they are, they're largely in the intelligence community, not in the information space, there, there is a role. Um, but, but it is it is a narrow niche. And General Breedlove, you're nodding your head. I'd like you to add to that. It was a great question. That's what I was nodding my head to. Um, and in the end, um, Cyber Command is more about the medium by which information is transferred and how to adjust and control and, if, if necessary, defend an attack in that medium. So I was shaking my head as I was trying to think through the answer. There's not a good answer right now. Um, all three of you referenced the strategic communications messaging strategy when it comes to countering ISIS. Can you specifically talk about how this is structured, both, uh, you know, within who the players are within DOD and state, how we work with our allies, and then the reason I'm asking that question is, if we were to identify the top threats in the I.O. space, I would list Russia, China, and uh, potentially Iran as top three. I'd love to get your assessment on the specifics of how that's structured what we can learn there, and whether you th think those three threats are where we should prioritize having uh, messaging strategies when it comes to those adversaries. Mr. Garneau, do you want to go first on that? Look, if I understood your, your question correctly, but let me just um, talk about the... So when you're talking about Russia information operations, it tends to be the military piece or the, cy uh, or the cyber piece and a little bit of the astroturfing of, of protest movements. But kind of China's in, a, in a, a broader space and so it doesn't have a direct bureaucratic counterpart in our systems and that's part of the problem, right? So we need to uh, create uh, a place where it all comes together and I agree um, with Dr Lumpkin, it has to be above the bureaucratic systems. But who, I mean, we've got to have as part of our law enforcement, you know, um, capability and ability to track United Front networking operations, to see it spread across all the silos of our systems. Um, and it's much bigger than just the military piece or the cyber piece. It's a, it's a whole of public opinion emphasis. So let me, let me rephrase my question. Since we have what you, the three of you have said is a successful strategy when it comes to countering ISIS mm. in the information space. Do we need to come up with threat-specific equivalents when it comes to countering Russia, countering China, and countering Iran in terms of our prioritization? Yes. 
Um, I, I, the way the construct was is in the coalition against ISIS, we had a, a communications working group where we would go and we'd meet uh, quarterly and we would sit there and hammer out, you know, the messages, the audiences, and, and, what the, and how we were going to work it against a single adversary. And, and it was an ad hoc group, worked very, very well. Um, but I think you have to be focused on who is the adversary and, and what are the outcomes you're looking for. General Breedlove. So what made this coalition and this capability successful is that the leadership of our nation and other nations in the coalition gave them the authority, responsibility, and accountability to take on the mission. And I would argue that that's where we're missing in the arrangements with Russia and China. We haven't really given one entity, like maybe the Global Engagement Center or some other entity that is uber other entities, uh, we haven't given them that policy, authority, responsibility, and accountability. Thank you. My time's expired. <laughs>